for tomorrow, I'm going to talk about NPP and IRR, and there's, there's actually quite a bit more subtlety to it when I was looking for the bit more depth. Um, I got some interesting emails from the people in the class, uh, Tate and Steve Barnett, some people came after the class and told to me about it and their interpretation. So we'll, we'll look at some of that and then also try to understand what, what I messed up in the last class and which I made. So let's step back first. If someone, if you, let's take yourself as an example. If you're investing $100 today, you're, you're making investments of $100, and next year, that, that investment pays you back $120. So $120 out, back times zero, and you get $120 back from it sell whatever you've made and you get $20, what's your rate of return? What percentage return have you made? 20%, right? Easy, F, your future money that you've received is 120 divided by one plus some interest rate lifestyle over one compounding period. That gets you the present value of 100 Solving for I star and two, so we made a 20% rate of return. Okay, so it's an intuitive uh, number that we need to understand. The rate of return on this investment of $100 is made 20% return. So that that's one thing to recognize. The other point I want to summarize from from previous is the NPV. That net part in the present value. So it refers to simply the total. So the, the total present value. Okay. The net can also be taken to infer that within the compound period, you use your net cash flow, your inflows minus your outflows. So the net flow of that within each compound period is zero. But what the net refers to here really is the total present value <coughs> over all n periods. And we, we, we looked at the interpretation of that in the last class. Uh, the interpretation was quite straightforward. An NPV that's greater than zero implies you're making a net, you're making a profit in today's money. On that project. Okay. So so that interpretation of NPV is straightforward. Uh, if NPV is equal to zero, you're just breaking even. Choosing my stock. I'll go 
So inflation plus revenue from a typical investment. Okay. So there's this a lot of this hinges on what we use for I star. The I star, and this is uh, one of the issues that came up with the class last time, is I had I had obviously read ahead in the notes, you haven't. So I had an intrinsic understanding of I star, but I hadn't really explained it carefully. So what I'm going to do here is just jump a little bit ahead in the notes. Um, in fact, this is, if you're looking for it, would be slide 85 in the notes. So I would say 86. One way of estimating I star is finding a baseline which is called the minimum acceptable rate of return. So it's the rate of return that we're going to use in a compound way, in a compound interest type of way, that we call it the MAR. Um, companies will, will call this the weight average cost of capital, WAC, WACC. Um, the key point here is that the MARR, the minimal acceptable rate that you're happy with as a return, is going to vary from one company to the other. So if you stack you know, you have your rate on your mattress, you're not doing anything on it. If you're invested in a bank, you maybe get one, maximum two, because you're blocking your balance. And you can keep going up and up depending on uh, stock market investments or then we can look at investing in other companies, other startup companies. And as you go up that ladder, you go to higher and higher risks. So the guarantee of receiving that rate of return is riskier as you go up. So it's obviously far more certain receiving a return as you go down. You can invest in GICs, no problem, and you can get your minimal half a percent from the government. Or you can look at investing in higher tech companies and the risk is much, much greater there. So here's some levels of MARR for different industries that you can use as a guideline. I would say some of these numbers are a little bit inflated, especially at the, the lower risk end, between 4 to 8 percent is now considered quite high. So, so, but this is from Peter's internal house, and it's about 15 to 20 years out of date. Uh, you want to probably update this based on your company that you work at. But low risk, low return, 4, 8, 4 to 8 percent. Uh, if you've got an established position in the market, 8 to 16 percent seems to be the, the, the norm here. Um, and then as you get to higher and higher research and development or totally new products that are entering the market, numbers in the high 20s, low 30s, and maybe even up to 40 percent would be considered a minimal acceptable return. So, as one of the, the students emailed me, one thing to recognize is that companies investing their money, they're not going to put their money in a bank account earning half a percent, one percent. So a company like, uh, like Google or a Canadian company that's, invest, that's receiving a lot of cash, for Tino's, Wild Wars, they're receiving a lot of money coming in, they're sitting on cash, they don't go and invest it in a bank account earning a minimal percentage rate of return. They've got financial people in the company who will be investing that in the stock market or other investments and making a greater percent rate of return. So these companies, their MARR is going to be 5 to 10%, maybe greater. One thing to recognize is that these companies are not also investing their, their cash in the stock market, they're also investing their cash in projects in their own company. Okay. So a company that's diversified, Suncorp for example, is, is a large company in Canada, it's got a diverse set of uh, locations, it's got multiple projects running all the time, it's cash that it's used, got available to it, it 
can invest in a multiple projects in the company. And that company will have a good history or track record of what rates of return they receive from their money internally. That's their internal rate of return, the IRR. Okay? They've got a good idea of that internal rate of return of what they can do with their money. So they're going to have a benchmark that's greater than, the, than say, investing in the stock market or investing in the bank. So the larger companies, they all have a good guide of what their MARR is. If you're starting up a company or you're working for a young company, with very little experience with capital projects, you, you may not have an MARR internally to go on. Okay. So you can use this as a guiding center to place, place the number. The established company will have a good track record of what previous investments have returned back to it. So that's the very minimal rate of return that they're looking for. So if we go and see that, one way to interpret that percentage rate is as an opportunity cost to the company. So an opportunity cost, if, uh, there's a nice example on Wikipedia that I'll just take from there. If you're at a restaurant and you're looking at the menu and you want, you see, well, this, I really want the salmon. Okay, but there's also the steak that looks really good. Which one do you take? Steak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you take the salmon, it's better for you. No, you take whatever you pick, but the opportunity cost is the cost of the other option that you've foregone. If you pick the steak, the opportunity cost there is the price of the salmon that you've got. If you pick both, what is your opportunity cost then? <laughs> the money you spend? The money you spend and your loss of reputation of the other people who eat it. So there's the opportunity cost there. Your appearance of the people who eat it. So, in a company, it's the same way. They can choose to invest their money in projects internally or outside the company, in the stock market or in other companies. There's always a way that they can choose to use their money. If they don't use their money, they're, they're, they're not going to make anything on it. So that's the zero. If they choose to invest in the stock market, they make 5%, or they may choose to invest in another project, and that's the project we're evaluating now in this class. Is for a new potential project, should I invest it in there, or should I keep it in the stock market, or should I keep it in what I would just call um, I the other source? So we'll call this I star as the other source or the MARR. So I'm always choosing between I star, the minimal acceptable rate of return, or the current project I'm currently evaluating. So those are, you always have an option to spend your money. Okay, so that's what uh, this next slide is about. We'll talk about independent alternatives in today's class. Your, your one alternative is to do nothing or to do the project that you're currently considering. Okay. So the do nothing alternative in a large company implies that you can invest your, that company's money in whatever investments they would normally generate their MARR at. Um, or, or, for example, a bank account, if you, if you don't really know what your MARR is, that could be a suitable percentage. Okay, so now we're going to move to this next point here, and then we're going to talk a bit more about ECFRR. So, if you're comparing independent alternatives, which one do you pick? You pick the project that gets you an NPV greater than zero at the MARR percent, whatever MARR is, and use that percentage in your NPV calculation, you get your NPV, and if it's greater than zero, do you go with the project or not? The other one, the other metric that you have available is if I calculate my discounted cash flow rate of return, and it exceeds the minimal acceptable rate of return, do I take that project? So we, in the last class, we calculated discounted cash flow rate of return. And so that, in the example we had on the board there, that was the 23.6%. That generates an NPV exactly of zero. So that's your DCFRR, is at 23%. If that exceeds MARR, do I go ahead with the project or not? Or do I use the metric that if NPV is greater than zero when using a rate of return equal to MARR? 
where I go with it. You've got two, two ways to pick a project. Which one do you use? So with the first one, that one is pretty much if your MPV is greater than zero, you're making a profit. But if you use the FRR, it's just kind of breaking the Okay. So Matt says pick the first one. If your if your DCFRR is equal to your your rate of return, you can just break the yes. I'm the author track because we're both going to give you the same answer. As in the assigned question. Okay, so uh, because we have options to do both. Okay. Okay. If you have a better DCFRR, it makes more sense to invest in that. If you're not going to be making as much profit. So like, you'd have to look at both and make sure this Okay. You want to look at both and make an informed decision in trade. Andrew? I'd go to the second one because if you have an MARR already set up, then you can invest that into the stock market to get back 5%. That's one way to invest it. And then the only way you can put a project over that is if you have a DCFRR appropriate. Okay. So, uh, we've got multiple, multiple uh, answers here. So here, both, both are, in fact, are used. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about in today's class. Uh, we're going to look at, at some cases where you can get one answer with DCFRR and then a different answer with MPV. Most often, both of these metrics will select the same project. Okay? But sometimes you can get it so that one is picked over the other. So we're going to look at some of those cases. That's why I'd rather slow down and, and understand this carefully, because guaranteed, one of these days in the future, you're going to be sitting at a table with financial people, and they're going to be drilling you on this. And if you don't <coughs> understand NTVs and IRRs and the difference between what each one of them is doing, and then more importantly, how can each one of them be adjusted up and down, you're going to be lost. Okay, So it's critical that you want to be the person, the engineer responsible for a project, and you're going to get that budget approved, you're going to have to talk with people who deal with these sorts of terms every day. You're in the disadvantage at that table when you're talking to financial people. Financial people are holding the budget, they want to release it. You've got to talk their language. They don't want to hear chemical engineering. They want to hear finance. So we have to understand these terms and what can adjust them. Okay, so let's take a look at back to ECF RR, just to understand that one a bit more carefully. That was the explanation I messed up last class. We're going to try and understand that in a more careful way. So if I go back to this example from last class, so let's just if you recap, we had some cash flowing out, 91,000 in the, in the zero period. Then we had cash inflows of 20, 40, 40, 40, 30 percent. And if the minimal acceptable rate of return is 15 percent, so if I put in a value of 1.5 up here, I calculate an NPV over on the right hand side of $20,630. So let's just take let's just take some note of that. So if if I start with 15%, my NPV that I calculated is $20,630. If my size 0.3, I get an NPV of minus 11,748. So if you were working in a, in a company whose MARR was 15%, go or no go? Go. If you're working in a company, high tech, their MARR is 30%, go or no go? No go. So it's, 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 it's clear. You keep, if I'm working in a company where the minimal acceptable rate of return that's expected is 30%, this project is going to make a loss for me on a net present basis. In a present value basis. If you had the coincidence of working for a company when that MARR uh, is exactly 23.6%, you're going to get NPV equal to zero. So it's not 
there's nothing magical about this. It's just if you happen to have this very special I star that's equal to 23.6%, then APB is going to be zero dollars. You're just breaking even indicating that that's just a marginal investment. The company could have gone either way. They could have kept their money in their usual investments, or they could have gone with this project. It's immaterial which option they pick. What about contingency? A lot of projects. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a minute. Yeah. When you're looking at something like that, though, I mean, these are very, uh, very generalized terms. I mean, they've established this number because that's what works on the company. But the project still has the potential to make more money. So are those factors, I guess without being considered your emotional factors, you're crossing your fingers that you're going to make more on it? or Okay, so it comes a bit to contingency, but if you know the project is going to make more money, then that should be in your NPV cash flow already. Right. So anything that's certain goes into NPV. Uh, when you get to uncertainties, that's when we call sensitivity analysis. We're going to get to that in, in, in the next year. How would you compensate for, say, something like uh Obviously, you can't compensate for a stock market crash. But say you've got a, a bad month in sales or a bad year in sales, mm -hmm. and your sales forecast said that this would be a profitable investment. Is there any way you can compensate for that sort of stuff? Remember, what we're looking at is at time zero now. We have no idea whether we or not we're going to have a bad sales month in the future. Yeah. So what we will do is we'll prepare multiple scenarios, and uh, the upside and downside, as we'll call them, and then. We will go based on that. If the downside is still profitable, then it's still telling you to go ahead. Right? So the sensitivity analysis is, is phenomenally important. Um, similar to this, so if IRR in the company was 30%, they won't go if it was 40, 50, 60%, no matter what the percentage is, as long as it exceeds this cutoff here, that company is not going to invest in the project. So this is this is where we had the hangout last class. Right? The key interpretation is as long as your MARR exceeds this value, this investment is not profitable. So let's write that down. If MARR exceeds the DCFRR, which in this case is 23.6%, then the project is not profitable. from an NPV perspective, taking time value of money into account. Okay, so that's that's what those slides were saying simply last class. So the mistake I made last class was twofold. Firstly, I didn't concretely introduce the idea of MARR to help set what the baseline should be. And then secondly, I had this diagram here of NPV up showing where it crosses zero, and then I superimpose the vertical line at, say, at 15%, and people say, well, at 15%, I'm still making why, what is, what's the difference between 23%? Surely a number lower than 23% is better. The confusing thing there is, you can't do both. Either you're investing in this project, that's one option, or you're putting your money in a bank account and keeping it there, and generating whatever percentage MARR it is. You're doing one or the other. You're not trying to do both. Okay, so is this, this, this needs to be clear. The reason why we pick a project based on DCFRR, when, as long as it ex exceeds your, your internal rate of return, minimum boundary, MARR, you go ahead with that project. Okay, that must be clear to you. Okay, we kind of delayed that a little bit, so I'm going to move on from there. And now we're going to get to the interesting thing. If, let's keep this example up. Intuitively, I would like to just... Has everyone got this down? I'd just like to use this board space here. Yeah. So are you saying that the MAR and the IR are the same thing? No, internal rate of return Minimal acceptable rate of return is just a threshold number. IRR is this percentage that we're talking about. They're not the same thing. And what's, like, what's, you said, is the IRR similar to the DCFRR? DCFRR is the discounted cash flow rate of return. It's the percentage 
when you just break even on, the, on that NPV curve. So just exactly where you coincidentally have the case that if I use a, a, a rate of return of, of that percentage, that I would coincidentally have it. My, my, I wouldn't break, I would just be breaking even. I would not make a profit or a loss. So is it correct to say that if the IRR at which you break even is called a DCFRR? Yes. The IRR at which you happen to break even is the DCFRR. Yes, that would be a, a great way of explaining it. Okay, now we're going to take a look and see if we really understand this concept. So if this is my base case and it's up here on the on the board. So I've got minus 91 in my first period, plus 20, plus 40, plus 40, plus 40, and then plus 30 in the last period. <coughs> the NPV using a rate of return of 15% time value of money getting $20,630. Okay. And the IRR I got for this was 23.6%. So this is my base case. Now we're getting to something that was raised earlier that I read. What if we didn't achieve quite the income that we hope for. So this we'll call this the downside. I still sink 91,000 into the project, that is, that's certain. But in my first year, I don't make any money. I just happen to break even. Maybe I'm selling this product onto the market at a loss, and the income I do make is exactly equal to my expenses, so I'm not making any money in the first year. And I'm, even in the second year, I'm only making plus 10. And then after that, my product maybe gets some recognition in the market and I get the remaining cash flows that I'd expected. Question, what's going to be the IRR for that project? Is IRR measured in... Oh, IRR, sorry. IRR, yeah. yeah. What is the rate of return? Firstly, greater, are you going to get a greater rate of return or a lower rate of return? This one's going to be intuitive. Lower rate of return. You're getting less money back from this project. All your costs are the same. Your income's the same, actually, in year three, four, and five. Year one and two, you're getting lower income. Your rate of return has to be lower. Okay? Intuitively, you must, must feel that. Your internal rate, your rate of return is going to be lower. I see. Okay. It's actually causing this issue. It's this So your DCFRR, your discounted cash flow rate of return is, is going to be low. It will be lower to the order of 7.69%. So if this company's MARR is 10%, do they go ahead with this project? No. On the downside scenario, they would disregard this project if the MARR was 10%. NPV is um, a little bit of math, it's minus 19,445. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at, it, at the optimistic upside. You're still sinking 91,000, that's certainty, but you're assuming your product is going to do so well in the market that you're going to get boom sales at the beginning. Then you're going to get back to what your predictions were originally. You assume that maybe uh, you get an initial uptake by, uh, by some customers, but then you start to lose market share back again, back to your original projections. Plus 40, 40, 40, and then final 30. Rate of return going to be, what's your DCFRR going to be? Relative to your base case? Definitely higher. 42% in fact. And your NPV, greater or, or smaller than the base case? Also greater than the base case. You're going to make more money. 
you get this greater chunk of cash flow coming in than you did during your base case. All other numbers remain the same. So your NPV at 15% time value of money is $55,413. So we have to be comfortable here with, with two things. For a given project, given changes in this cash flow relative to base case, we must be able to anticipate which direction IRR is going to move and which direction NPV is going to move. We have to be able to do that. Because when you're sitting around the table discussing this project with your colleagues, that's going to be the first thing that they're going to do is, what if, what if, what if? What if we have better sales? What if the product fails? What if your capital costs are greater? What if we get a lawsuit and we get a negative 50,000 here in year four? What's going to happen? You must be able to anticipate what these effects are going to be without having to do the calculations every time. Okay? So everyone clear on the directions of which NPV and IRR should move in for these fairly simple changes in cash flow? So now let's take a look at another example that's in the notes. This one, um, some students were asking this. It's related a little bit to the assignment question of the, of the three different investments. There's some similarity here. Here's three projects, A, B, and C. So this is back in your notes now on page, page 49. So three sunk cash flows of $1,000 in the first year. Project A then has the following cash inflows in the remaining three years. You get a big chunk of money in the first year, then slightly less in the second year, and then increasing up into the third year. Project B has the same sunk money, but then you're getting 350, then 470, and then a greater amount of cash at the end. So project B e would correspond to a project where your investment is taking longer to pay off. In the first project, your investment seems to pay off rapidly. Your payback period is in fact much earlier in project A. Your payback period in for project payback time for project B is much further in the future. You're getting the money further out. Project C, you're seemingly getting approximately the same dollar figures flowing in over, over, over three years. Which project is better from an investment point of view? And why? So who selects A and, and or who can give, even if it's an intuitive feeling for why project A would be better for you? You're getting that big chunk of money early on. And why is that desirable? You break it even earlier. You break it even earlier. The time value of money is less effect on the overall. The time value of money has less of, of an effect on those early periods. Yep, break it. Lower risk for investment because I'm going to have put this capital forward, but I'm going to get two quarters of it back. Lower risk investment, you're going to get your capital back right away and possibly able to redeploy it, Sean? Same, same thing. So that's one option, and, 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 and I like the way you're thinking here. Yeah. So let's, let's take a look at the DCF. Uh, so let's take a look at the cash flow values on a discounted basis first. Uh, it's really just a, a, a graph of those previous numbers that are taking cash flow into account. All three projects have the same sum costs. Project A gets this money coming back in earlier, slightly less, slightly less. So you recover your money quicker and then there's a, a decrease. Project B, on the other hand, you get a ramp up in your inflows over time, and project C roughly constant over time. If you calculate the DCFRR, you get 20% for all three investments. So what's going on? Is this as, as the guy is asking, different cash flows with the same DCFRR percentage. 
Is that correct? Is there a mistake in the slides? Which one gets greater NPV? So, yeah, we'd have to take a look at the summations of those, those bars over time of those dollar figures. Yeah, that, that NPV isn't filled in over there. Okay, so here's, here's an important point, is that you can get projects with the same DCFRR, but what I would call the cash flow velocity, or the, the, time, the timing of those cash flows, can, can be quite different. So many people have this intuitive feeling, and we're asking as well for the one assignment question, is surely a project that's paying me back the money earlier would be more desirable. And that's right. If you, if you want that certainty, that's absolutely right. If you're looking at it only from a rate of return perspective, all three have the same rate of return. But the NPV is going to give you a more subtle <coughs> interpretation, a more useful interpretation, I would argue, than just a pure IRR number. Okay, that's the one thing I want you to get from today's class, that IRR is just, you've got NPV over time, uh, sorry, NPV against the percentage rate, NPV is going to do this, and that value over there is my DCFRR. That's one number that summarizes that curve. It just happens to be a single point along this trajectory that summarizes the investment. The NPV as a function of the, of the interest rate is actually quite useful. I'll show you some examples of different curves in a minute. And then the other thing that's very useful to take into account is the NPV flow over time. So those cash flows plotted against time, as, as shown over here, will, will also change in investment. That's something we cannot put a number on. But understanding what NPV is over a period of time is, is important. So cash flow timing is, is critical in a project. That is the DCFRR. It's when it makes even the same. Yeah, I, I, I intend to always say DCFIRR or DCFRR, sorry. Where is IRR? No, what, where? It can be there. Okay, yeah. 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 MARR is, is an internal number that's always fixed. A rate of return is just a concept of, of a percentage rate of return. ECFIRR is when you use your this kind of cash flow and find where your NPV breaks even. Okay, so if I had a project here, so let's call this project A, with that an ECFIRR. Try to be more consistent in my literature. And I had a second alternative project that had a trajectory such as this. So we call this project B. And let's say my minimal acceptable rate of return in my company, MARR, is here. Which project do you go for? A or B? From an NPV perspective, which project do you select? B. B. So an NPV perspective simply compares that NPV value up there with this NPV value down here. So the NPV for project A is that dollar value. So NPV is always measured in dollars. And the NPV for project B up here, greater NPV for, for project B. The IRR or DCFRR for project A is here, DCFRR for project A, DCFRR for project B is the point over there. Project B has a greater rate of return than project A. So from that, from that perspective, from a DCFRR perspective, select project B as well. So in this case, both agree. So as long as your DCFRR for the project 
exceeds your MARR, you will pick that project from, based on the DCFRR metric. I'm only considering rates of return as my criteria. As long as my rate of return exceeds my MARR, I will pick, pick the project. Uh, in this case, I will pick the larger of the two projects if I only have to invest in one of them. If I can invest in both of them and I have the capital, I, would, I could pick both. If I have limited capital and have to only pick one, or if project A and B were mutually exclusive, I would pick the higher of the two based on DCFR. Based on NPV's perspective, NPV simply takes a single point along these trajectories and finds the point in that vertical direction I fix MARR. So now that interest rate is fixed. This is a PI star. That interest rate is fixed. I, I pick the two projects, either of the projects that has the highest NPV. That should be, that's clear. Now let's take a look at cases which do occur quite frequently. Is can I move this over? So this is, a, this is an example where picking based only on discounted cash flow rate of return is going to lead you to a very different answer to when you're just using NPV. So higher isn't always better. Okay? In fact, if you're looking at pure dollars in your hand, in your bank account at the, at, after a certain period of time, Project A is going to return you, uh, it's going to get you a higher profit in PV. The dollar value in your bank account by the end of that project is going to be greater for Project A than if you look purely on a rate of return basis. So you can't just naively go with rate of return as a percentage and always say higher is better. 
That's that's the one that's the key point that I want to take from this one. There's another point I want you to, to understand, and that's for projects that have that are called non-simple investments. So here's a project which is got an expense at the beginning, then generates some money, but then it's going to cost you some money at the end as well. So projects which have costs later on, these might be costs to clean up the site. Uh, to, to clean it up after the environmental state, or these might be amounts that you expect for lawsuits later down the line. There's an expense coming down the line. If you plot NPV versus interest rates, you cross zero at 9% and at 19%, so you get two DCFRRs. So this project from an IRR, DCFRR perspective is only profitable between 9 and 19%. Sounds counterintuitive, but you're going to make a loss on this project if your company's time value of money, or MARR, is lower than 9%. How, how does that seem right? What's happening here? Why are you getting a lower rate of return if your company's ECFR, uh, MARR is, is, is at, say, 5%? Because you still have those risks involved in the at the end and all that. It's all related to that big expense at the end. So if you've got a lower time value of money, you're discounting that to a, a, to a lesser extent. If time value of money is high, or the rate of decline of money is high, that 66,000 in the future is less and less heavy loaded. So that is weighted less in, in the end. But then you get to a point where no matter what, your cost or at a higher percentage rate, you can back down to the regular case of the negative. Okay, so this happens in projects where there's an expense coming up at the end. So this is, this is why I wanted to go through it carefully. Please make sure you understand this very, very well. And in the next class, we'll touch on depreciation.